the demo scene talk. So my name is Xavier Ho from CSRO. I'm really pleased to be here to MC in this session. So in this talk, we're going to have many, many people from various aspects and slices of the demo scene to tell you about their uh, interests and personal history and maybe a bit about just what is the demo scene exactly. Well, speaking to that, I'm going to first invite Joe uh, to, uh, he's the co-chair for the demo scene track along with John. So he's going to tell us about the evolution of demo scene. Please give him a round of applause. working on the, uh, the demo scene program for a little while and I thought it'd be great to go through the history. So just for a bit of context, uh, also known as Zig of uh, Defame, some old, uh, old demos. I've been doing demos on the Commodore for, for many, many years and I kind of had a bit of a quiet period but I came back in the, last, in the last few years I started writing a bit more code which has been fun. So let's go back in time, back to 1986. What a great summer. It was kind of like it is right now, nice and hot, but I was a lot, lot younger, <clears throat> and um, there was nothing but time. Another school holidays with nothing to do. But funnily enough, my next door neighbor, his dad brought home one of these little puppies, and goodness me, we did not make it into that sunlight for some time. Gosh. I think at that point, yeah, my vitamin D took a dive. So what we saw, what we played with was this just infinite number of games. It was just phenomenal games. We had seen nothing like this before. Hot Wheels, BC's Quest for Tires. It was just awesome. But then there were also cracks. So yeah, you know, we'd go to the computer club. They'd had a library borrow a game for a week. These games, their lifespan was generally less than a week. But, um, you know, so then you bring it back the next week and swap it. Eventually, we started swapping games in the schoolyard. But what we found is that, you know, not you know, these games were being protected by companies so that people couldn't copy them. And they had cracks. But what we saw at this point was things like this. People would take their credit across the, uh, you know, they kind of edit the sectors in the code and put their name in there. So in this case, yeah, Section 8, cracked in 1984. But soon after, these, these guys that were cracking games, they were wanting, they started forming groups. They wanted to take their claim and be the first and be proud of this, uh, you know, this work that they'd done. So they started forming groups and these groups got names. Of course, you couldn't call yourself your actual name because of kind of doing something a little bit illegal. And um, we started seeing intros. So here's one from back in, uh, I think, what, 86? 1001 Crew. All right, and we started seeing lots of cool little intros like this. And, you know, I saw these intros with the cool music and the animation and the scrolling and the effects. Very soon I had a collection of games and realistically I was collecting games not for the games. I was collecting them for the intros. This was awesome and I wanted to be part of this. Now the other interesting thing though was at the same time around the world these guys are out there making intros, they're making games, they're discovering glitches, glitches in the hardware. These glitches would do strange things. This is an example of a thing called a VSP, all of a sudden the whole screen starts shifting across if you get the timing just right. So what we found is harnessing the glitch, harnessing the glitches, manipulating the hardware at just the right moment to exploit the machine, getting it to do things that it, it should not be possible. And at that point, the demo was born. Uh, here's an example of a demo, it's a little more recent, um, called Cycle by Booze Design. <laughs> So, you know, you've, you, all of a sudden the music is next level. 
the uh, the visuals obviously a, com a computer with one megahertz you know CPU is not able to do real 3D twisting. This is all trickery, manipulating the hardware, stretching and and uh, flexing different characters to appear at certain times. Uh, and uh, hopefully you didn't miss uh, Matthias's talk going through some of the tricks of how these things were done earlier in the week, but. Uh, you know, this was this was the stuff that captured my imagination, and and as a kid, it was I just I could not get enough of this. Now, interestingly, at the same time, a thing evolved called the copy party, and you can imagine if this thing was driven by cracking culture, what was happening at the uh, parties was basically everyone was sharing discs, they're sharing games, right? So this is the early '80s, and the copy party became a thing. So getting together, sharing your your latest cracks hanging out with friends, playing games, coding, making some demos. It was awesome. Um, and the, uh, sorry. And, uh, you know, that was kind of uh, the first generation of, of the demo scene. And then what we saw was this evolution. It was, and it wasn't a, don't think of it as being a linear thing. It was a multi-layered evolution. But the next real uh, transformation was around the 16-bit the generation, right? The Amiga came around in 1987. People started getting the Amiga 500, which made it fundamentally changed uh, the way people thought about computer graphics. But again, this was very much about exploiting the hardware. So, you know, we saw things like, I mean, this is probably one of the most uh, famous demos, state-of-the-art by Spaceballs. <laughs> set the scene, the only other computer hardware that could do real-time animation like this was a Quantel, a paint box. It was pretty much the only other machine at the time that could do full screen, full motion movement like this. So, and just to, to set the scene for that, that's a, that's a multi, you can't pick up a Quantel paint box for less than like two to three million dollars. So all of a sudden for a sub one thousand dollar computer, we in a kid's bedroom could be looking at hardware that could do, it was mind blowing, right? This was a, a quantum leap. Uh, the next leap was a little more subtle, a little more subtle, but it was no less amazing. So essentially around the same era, we saw the PC graphics card, VGA graphics cards, mode X, right? So think kind of the doom era. Uh, all of a sudden these, the, the, PC started getting a foothold in, in, in real gaming and again, blew people's minds. The first person shooter, right? Um, at the same time, the Amiga had the AGA technology. So it was like the Amiga 1200. This was a new, again, a whole new class of technology. And what we saw is this uh, evolution where it was less about exploiting the glitches, a little bit more about the math, right? The creativity that went behind it. This is, a, this is really the generation of software where we saw people building their own rendering engines, which was incredible. Every demo had its own real feel, vibe, because completely different approach to building an engine, right? So no such thing as uh, uh, you know, um, OpenGL at this point. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So here we've got uh, a demo from the Amiga from AGA era. So again, playing on uh, the Pixar light but it was in my bedroom and I could see, you know, full motion 3D, some simple, uh, albeit hacked light, uh, uh, light effects. But this is where the PC started blowing away what was happening on the Amiga. This is um, second reality. And a lot of people, this was their introduction to the demo scene, right? It was second reality, got this incredible music by Skaven, uh, it's just the future crew blew people's minds. So we've got some um, Glenn's vectors in Glenn's vectors rotating, bouncing, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. This was insane. But shortly after, so this is a demo called Tribes, and this is where rendering engines started coming into their own. So this is 100% this is first principles rendering engine with a particle system, simple texture mapping, simple shading, fake shadows, but still incredible, right, incredible. This is early 90s. 
There's a demo called Tribes. Uh, this Again, this is one of those demos where I had this crummy PC with a VGA card and yet somehow I could see this. I could, I could play this. It was incredible. That kind of leads us to the next generation, right? The next generation was really around hardware abstraction. And what we found was computer hardware was just becoming so powerful, which is kind of funny when we look at it back now. But computer hardware was getting so powerful as the wall and, and so diverse in its nature that it was really hard to, first of all, target a single graphics card. It was hard to exploit a single GPU because there was this diversity of different GPUs and different graphics formats. We had voodoo cards and all sorts of stuff in the market. Microsoft released a thing called DirectX, which was this concept of hardware abstraction. And really, that's what OpenGL is for us today, and, and DirectX as well. This idea of providing a, a heterogeneous approach to attacking the hardware. Now, the problem with that is that all of those cool things we could do by exploiting glitches, they're gone. We only have the hardware abstraction layer to work with. Now, that's not such a bad thing, especially if we start thinking about adding some artificial constraints. And artificial constraints, like, what can you do in 64 kilobytes on a PC? Doesn't sound like much, right? I think most people's email signatures are bigger than that nowadays, right? Um, so that opened up the door to the next fundamental shift. If I think about this idea of the demo scene, what is the demo scene? It's about the convergence of math and art. And procedural is really the next place where we saw this incredible um, explosion of creativity. And I want to share with you probably the, f I can't say the first, one of the very first procedural demos. So what you're about to see is 64 kilobytes and when you see some other stuff that's 64K, you're gonna, this, this kind of pales in comparison. However, for the time, uh, so this was around, I think this was Mecha Symposium 2002 or three, um, and this blew people's minds. So that was, that was uh, Candy Tron by Fabrage, and uh, highly recommended as that kind of first, it was mind blowing, right? 64 kilobytes, we've got a vocoder, synthesis, all the audio track, all the visuals, all the models, all the motion, 64 kilobytes. 64 kilobytes, right? So that was where all of a sudden this hardware abstraction layer could be exploited through algorithmic techniques, right? It, this is very exciting. And when I talk about procedural, I mean in the sense that we could use uh, fundamental approaches to math to not only design the visuals and motion paths, camera paths, things like that, but also textures, sounds. We can use um, additive and subtractive synthesis to be able to create uh, hybrid synthesis sounds and track them together. And an entire culture began to build around this whole idea of procedural art, which is phenomenal. Now, at the same time, the parties, the parties, oh goodness me, they started getting really big. So here's a video of um, Assembly, I think this is Assembly 2009. 
yeah, they got pretty big. So we're talking enormous stadiums. Enormous stadiums in uh, Scandinavia, Germany. This is huge. And these parties have continued to run over the years. We've now have got uh, several different parties and they have uh, different specializations. So for example, X happens every two years. Really, it's just Commodore 64. Revision happens every, I think every year. Uh, and it's, it, but it's in one area, we've got just so many parties happening all over the world. It's phenomenal. All right, so let's, let's bring us fast forward to today. Um, really, the demo scene is, is, first of all, this enormous ecosystem of parties, and the parties are really the place to get started. It's a place to meet other people in that community and develop relationships, see what people are doing, share new ideas and uh, learn. My gosh, the learning. My brain hurts after going to any one of these things. But um, it's definitely the starting point if you're interested in this community. Uh, and uh, the other thing about it is, you know, there is an amazing set of releases happening every year. These demos, these demonstrations of really technical excellence are not limited to modern PCs. Remember how I said that evolution was multi-layered? Well, just because the Commodore 64 wasn't the latest thing didn't mean that there was no community that still wanted to be developing on it. Uh, there's a lot of people that just fell in love, just like me, they fell in love with that idea of exploiting hardware glitches and seeing what could be done. Same thing with the Amiga. Same thing with the Atari ST. Uh, and then there's also emerging demo scene uh, uh, communities on things like legacy consoles, right? Mega Drive. Uh, there's communities that are playing with things like Pico 8, which are uh, artificially constrained programming languages. There's people that are playing with uh, hardware, low-level um, uh, VLSI kind of chips and Arduinos and all sorts of things like that to, again, it's all about what can you do with the technology with no boundaries, right? no limitations. Um, it's, it's an exciting time because uh, what's coming out today is humbling to say the least. I'll show you a few PC demos, but for example, uh, some of the standout demos from last year would probably be uh, Eon by the Black Lotus, which was made for a standard Amiga 500. Uh, when you see it, it's hard to believe that's running on a machine that's that old. It's, it's uh, incredible. Unboxed by Bonsai. Again, Commodore 64 demo that's just mind-blowing what they're doing in there. Uh, and then there's a bunch of phenomenal PC demos, of which I will show you two out of these. Uh, and then, you know, Fairlight, uh, Smash, Matt Swoboda, absolutely pushing the boundaries all the time on the PC side of things as well. Now doing things like real-time path tracing. Uh, he's been doing ray tracing for a long time in GPU. So it's, it's just so exciting to see where it's moving and how it's progressing. So let's, let's take pause and look at a few demos. These are the most recent demos that I thought really uh, stood out as the state of the art when it comes to what's happening on real-time demonstrations. The first one is by uh, Andromeda Software Development and called uh, For Your Love.
So that's, that is an absolutely incredible demo. That's showing really what the state of the art is, right? Now, what we've seen evolve over the years is this concept of a, an aesthetic, right? So initially, you know, think, cast your mind back to the intros that we're looking at on the Commodore 64. They had their own approach. And these approaches are evolving through a combination of the state of the art, what the technology is capable of doing, combined with just creative ideas. Which is, again, this is the reason why we, we absolutely love you know, the guys that are in it. Uh, and when I say guys, I use that as a universal term. Uh, you know, if you're in it, you love it because it's this convergence, total freedom of creativity combined with um, completely lateral thinking. I mean, we look at some of the techniques that people use for exploiting, uh, for doing procedural in modern technology as much as fooling around with um, you know, zoetropes and things like that on Commodore 64. It's all about this, uh, you know, how can I creatively hack a concept, an idea, the technology. So let's take a look at the next one, which is... Um, The limit, so this had, uh, that previous one did not have size constraints. This one does. All right, so the one we're going to look at now is by uh, Abductee and his team in uh, Mercury. <laughs> like the guys in Mercury. Um, uh, and and uh, Michael will talk to you in a little bit about the, the, the process and, and uh, but, so I don't want to ruin that, but uh, I do want to show one of his pieces because um, I'm just so excited by it. So this is what I would call, and okay, so not just me, many people would call the current state of the art in 64K intros, all right? Uh, this was first place at assembly or revision? Revision, revision. first place at revision. Thank you. 
Fermi paradox or an animated GIF? Which one? 64 kilobytes, right? <laughs> oh man, yeah, that just messes with me. So um, uh, that's outstanding, right? So uh, why why care about the demo scene? Right? What's the point? Well, I think it's it's an important question to ask. Right? Why why is SIGGRAPH even considering this? Why uh, why would we have this as a you know a, a track? And why would you consider it as you know something you'd spend some time thinking about as far as being part of as a subculture. Well, first of all, there's it's just for the love of art, right? There's in its most pure form, there's this uh, approach to art and math. And when I say art, I use it interchangeably with music and all the all the facets that make creative endeavors, right? But it really is that true convergence of art and math. And for me, that's that's really exciting. The other thing that's exciting is the fact that there's an immense open, supportive community that's behind it. It's not about trying to protect trade secrets. It's not, a, it's, you know, largely everything is open source and everyone wants to tell you about what they did and how they did it. And it's such a phenomenal way to learn and build friendships and relationships that can literally last a lifetime. I would highly recommend getting involved. If you live in Australia, we've got syntax and flashback. So syntax happens in um, Victoria, in Melbourne every year, flashback in Sydney every year. Uh, Google it and find it. It's uh, or come and have a chat to us at the end. It's it's absolutely worth attending. And there's other events happening all over the world. In the US, there's NV scene. In uh, in Europe, there's so many. My gosh, it's hard to choose, right? But the revision X uh, next year's X is going to be huge because it's the what is it 10, 10 year anniversary. So it's going to be phenomenal. But um, yeah, you know, just find a party, turn up, and. From the minute you arrive, you'll be welcomed with open arms and your brain will melt from all the cool stuff that you learn. It's going to be awesome. So I highly recommend doing that. But there's, I think, a deeper, uh, actually a, a deeper one. And for me personally, it's a deeper one, right? It changes the way you think about problems. So instead of trying this brute force approach to solving problems, it makes you think about hacking the problem, working around the problem, playing with the problem to solve it. So, you know, creative problem solving is the most exciting thing that I think that has, has um, really changed my life when it comes to the demo scene. In fact, that's, you know, in running the company, running Thinking Studio, that is our secret weapon for the last 15 years is basically do more with less, right? Solving problems, technical problems, but not the brute force way. So I try to hold that kind of demo scene philosophy everywhere I go and I try and teach it to, like to my own kids when I go and teach other places, at university, wherever. It's always about trying to get people to think a little bit differently. Don't just go by the book. Don't just accept rules as being rules. Um, understanding things from first principles, awesome. Right? But then adding creativity, looking from many different perspectives. These are things that I think are, are I mean, you can see they're essential ingredients to solve the problems that, you know, like, look at a demo like um, Fermi Paradox, the demo you just saw. Mm -hmm. How could you possibly do that in 64K? There are lots of problems to solve. <laughs> and it's just about working down each one and, and, you know, questioning what people think are the rules and making up new ones sometimes. So that, for me, is very exciting. Uh, all right, thank you. Now, this is just the beginning. Now we get to hear from some guys that are doing some awesome stuff in the scene. So I'm going to hand it over to Xavier. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. I would say Sphero Kokao has changed my life today as well. I've been seeing that stuff. And this is really awesome. So uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, write it down, hold it on your phone, send it to your grandma, and say, what's the question I had again an hour later? We're going to have a panel at the end of the session. So we've got a few more talks for you today. And the next one up is uh, Michael Sanger. Please give him a big applause. All right. Um, yes, this is me. Um, uh, who am I? So I have um, a bunch of years of experience with a bunch of companies. Um, I am the founder of the first um, SIGGRAPH chapter in Germany, the one in Munich, which um, unfortunately since I left Munich is um, not really a thing anymore, but anyway, you have to try, right? Um, I have moved to San Francisco and I'm doing my own startup to, called Unbound.io. Please feel free to check it out. But I'm first and foremost a demo scener. Yay! 
right? So, which means that I am lazy and um, I am very impatient, which means I am efficient. <laughs> uh, here are a couple of, of shots. This was a um, 4K image. And 4K is not the resolution, but the size of the executable. Um, we did for, I think, revision 2012. Um, I think this is around about the same year. Um, 64K stuff. Yes, uh, uh, as it tr is traditional in, in demos that uh, you greet people, uh, I greet people. So let's talk about demo scene competitions, and especially those ones the ones where there is a size restriction. Because um, um, the, the big question is, um, how, how do you get creative? If you smell food, you get hungry, right? So this is like a very uh, good understood mechanism. But how do you make yourself creative, right? There is no creativity to smell, and you become more creative. So um, I'm going to go back to like something that, that Joe said. Um, um, you should like question uh, what is wh what are the givens and and then just ignore them. So um, show of hands here, who's still using uh, MS DOS? Okay, one person, <laughs> one and a half person, two persons, right? So every time you look at an executable, um, this is you just like compile it. Every time you compile an executable for Windows. This appears uh, at the top of it. It says, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Why is it there? You could accidentally start it in DOS, and then this would get displayed, right? So every time you do that. Um, this is actually the standard. This is how Microsoft defines it. But um, we just use those bytes for other things, right? <laughs> OK, so um, there are people that say uh, you shouldn't handwrite assembly code. I uh, disagree. So uh, I have a simple example. And this is the only coding example I'm going to go through. And there will be only other stuff. Uh, so I hope I don't lose the audience completely. Uh, so this is like a, a, a simple function that sets like a gray, grayscale color in OpenGL. So if we run this to a compiler, this happens. Complicated stuff. The compiler has rules where uh, it actually has to validate the flow and check, oh, is this maybe not a number, or it's a denormalized flow, and set the uh, uh, according flags so then you can handle exceptions and all these kinds of things. But since we are making a demo, and we already know that we are going to put in uh, valid floating point numbers in it, uh, we can do it like this, and we're done. It looks much shorter, it's much more read readable, and also, uh, it is only 14 bytes in so, uh, instead of 34 bytes. So we have saved 20 bytes in one line of code. Yay. All right. Uh, so I have a bunch of more examples that um, I'm not going to go through here because they're like, ooh. Um, and I rather want to talk about teamwork. So if you want to see the other coding examples, uh, please come to the exhibition area after this. I will be there, and uh, we can nerd out as much as we want to. Right? So uh, one of the things uh, that you encounter is, oh, now you can do like all these fancy coding tricks, and you can like hack the executable and, and use a couple more bytes. But um, most of programmers, and I am uh, also like a very bad example of this, we're not good artists. We have no good feelings for colors. So what you want to do is you want to have a, a big group. And Mercury is always, uh, um, demo making is always teamwork, right? So we are seven people within Mercury. And we have uh, artists that are like not programmers, right? You can like set them, oh, here is this piece of code. And if you change this value and call this routine, then you can change this thing and so on and so on. Not going to work. So uh, I have two examples of, of uh, demo tools. One goes back to 2003. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to do live demos now. The thing that you shouldn't do at SIGGRAPH, run software on your notebook. But yeah, we're challenging that, right? All right, so this is a simple tool that uh, um, utilizes a, a technology called operator stacking that goes back to the book The Mystical Man Months. Uh, somebody realized that if you have like these boxes uh, with the wires between them, if you just uh, keep away the wires and use them like Legos, um, you can have like a graph language, and it's pretty powerful. And it also is like good for my laziness, because A, I don't have to make the wires and like drag them and connect them. And B, I don't have to code the wires. So, all right. So, 
Um, and also in, the, in, in terms of simplicity, there are only three uh, types of operators this tool can have. Uh, creators, filters, and things that put things together. Um, so simple example, I'm gonna just make a checkerboard texture and I'm gonna make a, let's say, a noise texture, right? So checkerboard texture, noise texture. And I'm gonna use one of those to displace the other one. If it lets me, no, come on. All right, and um, I, can, I can go back in there and maybe say, okay, checkerboard, I want you to be blurred. Uh, maybe a bit more, so we can see actually what's going on. Right, and now we get this kind of texture. And, and if you if you only save those parameters and keep the functions, then this is uh, also like less than 20 bytes. Uh. Sorry, dry mouse. Anyways. Um, to skip ahead a bit, I have I've made an example. You can obviously do this also with um, operators that are more complex and that, uh, handle 3D functions and post-processing filters. Um, yeah, and if you spend like a um, couple of minutes to make this graph, uh, you get these these nice demo effect cubes running around. Okay, so um, this is Circa uh, 2003. So now we're going to fast forward uh, to circa 2014, which is when we made our first bigger demo, which was called The Timeless. It has a couple of nice scenes with oceans and uh, probably a bathroom. Uh, and uh, uh, um, that kind of place. Anyways, um, so uh, what, is, what is fun about this tool is that uh, sort of all the coding parts are hidden. And this is sort of the timeline, which for me, as a lazy person, is really, really good because I don't have to care about the cutting. I can just give it to Psycon, our, our graphics student, and say, hey, here, um, these are the scenes. This works roughly like After Effects. Uh, just put them together, tweak a bit of parameters, uh, and, and make it nice, and I am done. So um, I'm going <coughs> to I'm gonna just uh, show what, what, what his workflow was, would look like. He would just go in there and just like, grab one of those keyframes and look what crazy stuff is programmed in there and oh, oh my God, the, the, the world is spinning, what, what is happening? And this is not only like a post effect, I should be able, yes, I can still like fly through this uh, now a bit twisty world. Can I make this faster? Yeah. I'm so not a first person shooter person. Oh my God, no. All right. Yes, so um, this is sort of a, a really, really brief evolution of demo tools. I could go into it more, but uh, I want you all to come uh, to the demo scene section in the exhibition hall. So um, what else does it say on my slides? Yes, uh, I also want to give a, a big shout out to Shader, to Shader Toy, which is sort of the, the thing in the middle. So my talk is more like the scaffolding around it. So what does it actually um, take to make a demo? How do you get the, the size so small? Um, also, there's um, a lot of the, the um, uh, shader code that we use. Is uh, There's a lib. It's free. It's uh, mercury.sexy slash hg underscore sdf. Um, do I have any conclusions? Yes, restrictions can make you creative. That's what I think. That's sort of the smell of food uh, to creativity. Uh, demo competitions are fun. Uh, sharing is caring, so the way we do it in the demo scene is most likely we just give somebody a USB stick because if you upload stuff to GitHub, A, you have to clean up your code and use like names for the functions that make sense and not call things like ham and shit like that. Um, and also, um, if you go to like a competition and um, you win it and then you give the person that went uh, second, if you give them your source code, then you know that next time you're gonna show up, they're gonna know all your tricks. So you have to up your game, which is also like a fun thing to do. Um, yes, uh, uh, I think we do the questions afterwards. So uh, by the way, a uh, uh, slight anecdote to this. So this leads to my website with a bit of um, uh, stuff about this talk. So I went to IRC and like asked my, my guys, hey, um, I want to put like the Mercury logo in, in a 2D barcode. 
how do I do that? And they were like, uh, we don't know. So I was like, oh, okay, I figured it out myself. So then I went back after a couple of minutes, like, hey, guys, I figured out how to do this. Uh, you do this, and then you do that, and then you hack the checksum. And they were like, yeah, we have figured out uh, other ways of doing it. So uh, Urs and Lars also came up with like a different version of like how to hack the barcode. So all of these lead to the same page. <laughs> all righty, that concludes my part. So in stark contrast to what you just saw, this is, I'm going to show you guys my first demo scene. So this is, lower your expectations a little bit for this next one. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll talk a little bit about how I kind of got involved and, you know, hopefully there's some useful tips. Sorry, that was a little loud, but I <laughs> hope you're okay. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Um, sorry, I wasn't quite playing at rate, but close enough. I'm going to switch over to my Mac laptop to show you some slides, and we should be on. So I called this total zag, um, and there's someone named Zig here. You're Zig, right? So that's kind of funny. Um, and uh, that's just because that's my favorite um, debugging statement, you know, printf zag. It's all over my code. And when you're doing demo scene, you actually don't often have access to printf due to the restrictions for size coding. So you print your debugging into the pixels. So kind of every pixel is its own zag in this. So that's the title. So um, my name is Paul Kanyuk, and I had to pick, this is my first demo scene, so I had to pick a scene ID. So I'm going for Gelato Von Bismarck. Um, so henceforth, that will be my name. Um, my background, um, even though it's my first demo scene, I've been in the uh, CG industry for a while. I got started with Pixar uh, 2004 as a uh, shading intern. And actually, uh, it's funny, one th I, I just saw Inigo's uh, keynote talk, and um, one of the things that inspired him uh, was the 2003 SIGGRAPH talk, Render Man Theory and Practice. I was there, and that inspired me as well. So uh, it, it's that, that really got me into shading and procedural shading, but... That actually wasn't ultimately to be my fate. I ended up doing crowd simulation on Ratatouille, and since then I've been a crowds guy and a crowd supervisor. But I still love procedural shading, and demo scene kind of is maybe my way to give that a try again. Um, Pixar actually has its own uh, demo party that occurs every year, organized by uh, Rick Sayer. And in 2017, I gave it a try, and this is um, a touch designer visualization for some MIDI controllers. That's my coworkers and friends, Aimee Kut and Florian Hecht, playing a MIDI drum. I'm on a keyboard, and Aimee's actually on a xylosynth, which is a MIDI xylophone. And so I was really interested in sort of how uh, music can uh, uh, be visualized in ways that are a little better than like just a Winamp plugin or something like that. So, um, but this was not demo scene, really. This was a wild category entry. This is just a touch designer doing what touch designer is designed to do, which is you know, music visualization, among other things. Um, but one of the things that really inspired me was actually at uh, SIGGRAPH Asia last year, uh, Control-Alt-Test gave a making of course on their demo H Emergen, which was a 64K demo. And that's where I first kind of learned how you can start achieving you know, these sort of results uh, at such a small size. Particularly, I had no idea how the music was done. And this was a great uh, demo that showed how you actually can, using demo tools, still make music with MIDI the way you normally would, but then go through these other um, tools to get header files that you then include in your project to uh, execute the music. So I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out how to do some music that's going to fit in 64 kilobytes, and if I have some time, I'm going to throw a GLSL shader on it. And that's what you guys saw. So uh, what I worked on was just, I used Logic, you know, like, uh, a regular DAW on uh, Mac, and just MIDI notes and CCs to control the uh, timbre of the sound. And one of the things I wanted to figure out from the beginning is how to get those CCs to also drive the visuals. Um, so that's what I spent a lot of time doing. Um, so while I like using Logic on Mac, uh, the demo tools don't run on Mac. So what I had to do is record the MIDI out onto uh, Reaper on my uh, Windows PC and then use that to uh, start working on the sound design. So for that, I used uh, 64 Clang, uh, which you can get from GitHub. It works just out of the box. I didn't really have to do much. And thankfully, there are example node networks. So I did not have to create each one of these by hand. Um, I started with one that worked, figured out how it worked, and then started doing my own stuff. So if you take a look at what's actually there, there's really just four instruments in that. There's your drums on the right, which are reading samples from a wavetable. Um, I've got um, two bass sort of synths, um, which are bass stacks of oscillators with distortion and LFOs, the LF, not LFOs, um, low pass filters. And those filters are being driven by the CCs. And then the lead is just slightly different settings kind of on the same thing. So nothing super high tech. I just, I got something working and then I exported it. So that, that was about as far as I got with the sound. Um, and it's cool, actually, you'll notice on the top there, there's a button called Export Song and another button called Export Patch. You hit Export Song, you get a header file that looks like this, and that's all your notes, and um, note ends, note starts, and so on. 
And then you get one for your patch, which is all the nodes you put together in a form that can be consumed by the 64 Clang library. So then you got to put them in a Visual Studio project. Thank you, Inigo, again, for making it easier to get started with this on his website. He's got this iSystem 1K 4K. And that's why I ended up going with the 4K graphics, actually, because that's the project I, start, I uh, found. And yeah, again, it, it kind of just worked. So uh, props for, you know, and thank you for making that available. Um, in terms of the graphics, also another tool from uh, Inigo and uh, Paul Jeremias, uh, Shader Toy. This is his volumetric lines demo. And again, you kind of saw that in there. So I pretty much started with this code and it's a bunch of line you know, distance fields, about 128 of them that are kind of being manipulated from like a one 3D noise function. And what I did is I basically stuck more noise basically in the inner loop, uh, uh, measuring the distances to each line. So even though I started with something that was very clean, I created a mess. And uh, <laughs> that, that's kind of what my demo was. So starting from something beautiful and just make it a little gnarlier. Um, so, uh, and also the frame rate dropped quite a bit once I started adding all this noise, which was a good incentive to move from a Mac laptop with no GPU to a Windows laptop with a GPU. That made all the difference in the world. And yeah, it's amazing what you could do on a, one of these these days. So I actually didn't have to spend too much time optimizing. Um, and yeah, in your Visual Studio project, you just include those two header files. And I thought I was good until I hit one big roadblock, which is how do you get the MIDI CCs to drive the GLSL shader? It wasn't clear initially. So I started hacking around. Thankfully, all the source code is there. This is the inner loop of uh, the sort of 64 Clang um, sound synthesis, where it's basically populating a sound buffer, which each uh, sample. I just found where in the global state the MIDI signals were, found out how to decode that, and I just stuck that after the end of the wave file multiple times, which is a really profligate use of memory, putting all your MIDI CCs just after the song ends. But it's size coding, not memory coding. You got a lot of memory on these machines, so that was, it was an expedient way to get my signals into the GLSL shader. So then you use your position um, you know, in the song to then read from that extra buffer, and then you can just pass those as GL uniform kind of arguments to your shader. And then you're good. So um, that's just a still, along with a baked out version of the demo, just in case it didn't play. Um, but yeah, so um, I'm, I really appreciate the community you know, making their code available. Uh, I, it was actually a lot easier than I thought. The biggest thing was just the MIDI CC stuff. And now that I've done this once, I see I've got to up my game a little to, <laughs> to compete with these guys. So, um, but yeah, it's really fun. Um, and I encourage you guys to you know, join the community as well. I want to keep doing this. So. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Paul. Um, we have one last edition. That's a star edition, I would say. So we have Paul DeVivic from Google VR, who's going to give us a whirlwind tour to the Commodore 64. Please welcome Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see here. These were some amazing demo scene things. I don't have anything particularly impressive uh, uh, there, but I am one of the many uh, computer graphics people of my era who uh, got my start programming a Commodore 64, and I had a couple of reminiscences uh, about that. Uh, here's some actual photos uh, from back in the day of uh, playing around with this thing. As you know, it had 64K of RAM, about 320 uh, by 200 pixels. You could only do 16 colors. You couldn't put any two colors right next to each other. You had to be clever if you wanted to get things to actually work out. Um, code looked uh, something like this when you would print it out. Um, and uh, when I had these computers, uh, really I got them because I wanted to do computer graphics. I just thought it was super cool stuff. I'd seen things like uh, Tron, The Last Starfighter, and it just seemed like, okay, if I get my own thing, I want to do some of that. Um, I think the thing is, is that um, it was really, really hard to make these things do just about anything. You would have uh, basic, if you wanted to make uh, pictures, you basically had to learn binary arithmetic. And I had pages and pages of graph paper that if you wanted to create the sprites, you'd draw them out first, and then in every you know, eight um, pixels there, you'd have to figure out which binary number, 0 to 255, corresponded to those eight pixels. So that seems to be um, summing those up there. 
Um, I never got an Amiga. I kind of uh, ended with Commodore 128, but the Amiga had this cool demo of a sphere bouncing around, which was super impressive. Uh, and someone came out with a Commodore 64 version of that, of this red and white ball, but I didn't like it very much because as far as I could tell, um, the, the, the pieces of the ball weren't like receding with the correct perspective distortion. It looked like when the, when the tiles in the middle of the ball went around to the side, they were still the same uh, thickness, and that seemed wrong. So I tried to address that a little bit. And instead of boing, I made boink. Uh, and then this was the, uh, the demo uh, that I made for that, and there it goes. It's actually all calculated with, um, thank you, <laughs> with proper things. Uh, the most elaborate thing that I did, um, actually I managed to pass off as a, um, a junior year of high school uh, physics class assignment, uh, which was to program the game uh, Space War. And I think probably the most impressive thing is apparently I actually made that logo with a light pen on the, um, on the screen. And I still like that font quite a bit. And um, in order to make these things do it, I actually had to get into doing, um, you know, pretty much using the entire computer. And you really learn about all the guts of what you have in your Commodore uh, to do that. Uh, the ML there is not machine learning, it is machine language, and so there was a section of that. There was some basic, you'd have to figure out where you have all the rotations of the sprites of the Starship Enterprise and the Klingon uh, Starship and allocating all of this stuff here. And here's like a little quick clip of uh, some of the uh, some of the things kind of going around here. Burp, burp. So I don't think I recorded it with actually two players, but you could rotate the spaceships, you could fire, and then eventually like, you could get something to kind of blow up like that, which is fun. Um, and so this passed off as a physics assignment because there was actually implementation of gravity and collisions and things like that. Probably the most helpful thing is it actually ended up being my first PowerPoint presentation that I ever gave. We didn't have PowerPoint. <laughs> But I had to give a, a presentation about uh, you know, the procedure, uh, the equipment used there, the cost of the equipment. So I made little pictures of the Commodore uh, and the monitor and uh, a couple of more little uh, light pen drawings. So um, this really affected me a lot. And as I was kind of ending my Commodore 64 work and going off to college, uh, where I started working with Macintoshes, that's when some of the coolest demo scene pieces came out, which I was very inspired by, and I remembered that. And so when I eventually became the, the, the chair of the SIGGRAPH 2007 Computer Animation Festival, we actually opened the show for all of the walk-in with examples of uh, the demo scene uh, uh, for that, to, for people to enjoy. And it's very exciting that we actually have the demo scene continuing here at uh, SIGGRAPH Asia 2019. I hope this is a, a continuing thing. The most, uh, I, I think, important thing about this is that a big spirit of the demo, demo scene is to be able to take a piece of equipment and do something that nobody's ever done before, nobody's ever conceived of doing before. And that really is actually the same spirit of SIGGRAPH as you try to create a new research paper, as you try to create something um, using whatever equipment it is, even if it's not from the 1980s, to try to create some algorithm that does something that nobody's ever seen before, that does something nobody's ever done before. And that's what every single one of our research papers is. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, this chance to uh, chat. I recently got to find my old Commodore 64 in my mom's house as she moved out to Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, demo on, thanks. Alrighty, so I believe we have a quick fire session for pretty much all the presenters. Why don't we uh, quickly introduce ourselves while I quickly dig up my notes on my phone. Okay. Let's start from the other end. <laughs> uh, hi, I, my name is Ivan. I'm originally from Siberia. Uh, my scene nickname is Provot from Jetlag Demo Group because like, I fly a lot of... <laughs> and. Um, I mostly do shader live coding and like 4K intros, a lot of them, and a bunch of other random stuff. Thanks. Hi, I'm Michael, and I just fumbled through my, my slides earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name's uh, Chris, otherwise known as Citrix. Um, I run Syntax Demo Party in Melbourne. Um, I also played the opening gala dinner uh, off a Commodore Amiga and a Sega Mega Drive uh, the other night. Um, and I mainly do a lot with music, um, whether it be for 4K PC or old school. Um, yeah, and I have 56 computers mainly made before 1995. <laughs> As a random fact. Ah. And no wife. <laughs> well, partner who's telling me to throw it out. So that's what happens if you keep collecting. 
Hi, I'm Paul. You just sort of heard my background, so passing it to Paul. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, me too, but anyway, at Google VR, we're working on uh, light fields, light stages, and lighting estimation. <coughs> Hi, I'm Matthias. Um, I was active in the demo scene from 1994 to 1996. Somehow that ended me up in this panel. Um, and it's been um, only a couple of years until I went back in only to, if only to see what, what the developments were in the last 30 years worth of, of demo, demo scene. Um, I was surprised to see that, um, I mean, I was doing C64 stuff back in the day and C64 is, is still around as a demo scene platform. Um, so, and actually as active as it was um, in the 90s. So um, this year alone we have seen dozens of demo releases just for, for this particular machine. Um, and it also has this built-in open sourcing, so since there's only 64 kilobytes of memory, you can scroll through that in, in half an hour or so, so there's no, really, really no good way to hide your code. So whenever you see a demo, you can pretty much take it apart into its pieces, um, even if you don't have the source code. Um, and yeah, that's my, my story. So. Thanks, uh, Matthias. Okay, so I'm Joe. We've met already, but my background really I started in the demo scene around 86, um, 87, probably 87, and then uh, uh, I got into the advertising industry, uh, like did a computer science degree, did a degree in fine arts, got into computer science and then uh, for a while I wasn't really that active, but similar to Matthias I kind of came back uh, around 2010 uh, with Flashback, which is a, a demo party in Sydney, and met up with the guys and really just realized how awesome that community was and how much I'd been missing out, you know, in just not being around those guys doing such cool stuff. So, uh, yeah, that kind of drew me back into the scene and I've just been active uh, probably more as just organizing and, you know, <coughs> helping guys out. Uh, and then in the last year or so, I've started doing a couple of releases, uh, getting back into writing 6502 code. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, by day run uh, a software company and UX business and by night try and hack 6502 code and manage four kids. <laughs> That's about it. That's awesome. 10, yeah, 6510. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So I'm pretty sure you, some of you may have questions that you've been holding. If it's the other kind of holding and we want to go to the toilet, that's fine. But if you have a question, the actual question you're, you're holding, this is the time. Raise your hand. Okay, there's one over there. I think we may have student volunteers uh, who can run the mic. Thank you. So one over there. I think that's the other student volunteer. No. <laughs> Hi. Uh, first off, thanks for all the awesome demos. They're just excellent. I've been following the scene from uh, probably around the procedural era, which uh, Zig mentioned in his talk, uh, the Farbrush, K. Krieger, um, Workzoig, that kind of thing. And uh, never really got into the scene, just uh, followed it mostly. But uh, just looking at all these demos, there's always, so there's the technical side, which is, uh, you know, making all this awesome art fit into tiny, tiny uh, code sizes. But there's also the, the more creative aspect, the, the sort of movie directing, sound directing aspect of it. How do you really, um, how do you get into that side of it? And what's the interplay between, uh, between the artsy side and the tech side? Okay, what's the interplay between the artist side and the tech side? I think that question, well, I'm gonna throw it to, oh, okay, Michael? Uh, yeah, so the, the interplay is uh, obviously that, um, for example, for the Fermi paradox that you've seen, um, we have stuff in there like the, um, uh, the fluid dynamic visualization on the, on the planet, and for the first couple of, uh, I think for the first 30 seconds, this whole system, doesn't really look good, so it's like in the background. So you know that, for example, this scene you cannot show in like the first 30 seconds because the atmosphere of the planet will not have uh, um, like evolved into something that looks good. So oftentimes um, these decisions that directors for like a movie can make pretty arbitrary. Uh, we have a bit of uh, uh, restrictions. So we're like, ah, okay, it's gonna gonna do some pre-calculation in the background, so we have to have like 30 seconds and can show then. So mostly it's that. So. Uh, often enough times uh, you make something that because you have to fit it uh, into the, <coughs> the 64K, you can only, some of the planets you can only watch like from one side. 
<laughs> because the other side looks a bit broken, and then you can see like, oh, that doesn't look like a planet. So, a, a lot of the times these decisions get like uh, dragged away from you, and you have to like work around it. But um, yeah, otherwise, I mean, as you can see, we we like to be inspired by uh, um, Kubrick or, or whatever whatever movie you just saw last, and think like, oh, I I can think we can do something similar like that, and yeah. So if you have any more questions, please just grab our student volunteer. But I would like to throw that question to one more person. I'm thinking maybe, yeah, you go ahead. I can also sort of add on that as far as uh, if you're saying how you sort of direct. It's, it's a bit of chicken and egg stuff with demo. It's like, you know, a coder will be sitting around and coming up with some ideas and things that they fiddled around with. Like, well, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. And you're in your Slack channel with just sort of rough ideas of stuff coming through. As a musician, I'm like, well, uh, cool, I'm seeing that. And if we colored this like this, or we, you know, we sort of, and, you know, I could order. So, so you start writing a track, and, I, and you say, well, well, how complex is this? How much can we do with this section? And you sort of get a feel for which part of a song might go with something visual. Um, and then the graphic designers will often come on board then and be like, oh, well, we could Im import this texture, or we could put this color set, and we could have this as a concept. And then suddenly, you've got an idea for a title. And then it sort of comes together a bit like that sometimes. Sometimes our coder will just, we just did some stuff in MS-DOS, for instance, and they just did captures of loops of just stuff that was uh, rudimentary, but I was able to get that in a video editing program. Um, ADS is my editing program, and I just line that up and I put sort of a rough version of a track under it, just got a feel for it, and then it's like, well, what do you feel about this flow? And then we'll put the credits here, and then, and then the graphic designer's like, oh, you will do. So you sort of all come together. But it's very, very different to designing a game or something that has interaction. It is much more that, yeah, that thing of, of you are creating a, a piece that's sort of a linear. Um, that's the thing that one thing we haven't mentioned about demos is that they do play the same every time you play them. There's a bit of a rule about it not having randomization um, <laughs> for various reasons in history that happened. But yeah, it's always the same when you run it. So it's, it's just like a mathematically generated film in a way. So, but that's our approach. You know, we. You know, we actually do do that. And then it's like, OK, cool. And then it goes back sort of with the coder and, and you go back into that pipeline of having a plan. And then it always changes as you go, because suddenly you discover something. It's like, oh, wow, I just discovered I could do six more things with this effect where I flipped it and done this. And then accidentally, they've changed one bit of code by mistake. And it's done something amazing, completely designed the screen. And you're all like, oh, wow, we've got to use that. So that's the thing when you're doing stuff with mathematics instead of designing it in, uh, uh, well, I suppose even if you're in Flame or After Effects or whatever, you can accidentally do something sometimes, just to put a minus in front of a number by mistake or something, and it just does something cool. <laughs> so that's a big part of playing around as well. So, and sometimes that changes the flow of it all. But yeah, it's not yeah. a bug, it's a feature, right? Yeah. So <laughs> did I see a question over there, or is it just someone who's like kind of raising their shoulder? Not really. OK, there's a question out in the front and one over there. So can we do oh, this one in the back? OK, so do that one first, and then we'll do front, and then we'll do over there. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Victor. Um, so let's imagine then a person who wants to get into demo scene um, in the modern world, and then what would be the tech stack for both 4K Windows demos and 64K uh, Windows demos? So I'm interested in everyone's opinion because you know there is a breadth of tech choice, like different assemblers, different compressors, different music uh, tools, different scene composing tools. Uh, what, what do you think would be um, a choice, like a um, toolbox, a modern toolbox for 4K and 64K for both graphics and uh, music? Thank you. So that sounds like a PC demo question. Maybe yes, I'll throw uh, it to I'm, I'm going to subvert the expectation for the question uh, by saying, I think the, the most important thing that you can do is just show up at the demo party. We're like a, uh, always open to new people. And um, it is, it is uh, when I went to my very first demo party, um, I, did a, I did a demo on a, on a PlayStation 1 that I hacked and sort of reverse engineered how to uh, do things there. And I wasn't able to like produce a CD that then should, because you uh, had to submit it on a CD. And so I found people that, that helped me like uh, getting into the process of how to manufacture this CD with like the, all the uh, hack code on it. So for me, I think it, the, the most important thing was just like find people and, and, and that, that help you give, you, give you new creative ideas and, and so on. Uh, as far as 4K on PC goes, um, there is a uh, 4K toolbox thread on a site called Poet that I can recommend. And um, 
basically everything is listed in there. So, but again, I, I, I highly recommend just come come to a demo party and, and have something, even if it's not finished. You're gonna find people that help you finish it and uh, it's gonna be fine. So I know Eva wanted to add something. Um, did you wanna to speak to it? Yeah, it was, uh, I, I just uh, like to give an overview like how modern PC 4K stack looks like. So basically there are three parts. Like one is the uh, runner, uh, initial initialization code that runs the intro itself. Then there's like mostly, like most of the intros just do a single shader for the entire screen and like do ray marching and stuff. And then there's, uh, uh, synthesizer, which is usually like for clan, there are a few other options, but m mostly is for clan. And you have some kind of a, like a, either Visual Studio project or like bat file that compiles it all together. And there's like one crucial piece of software is like Crinkler, which is like linker and um, compressor in, in a single like piece of software. So it like when it links, it also compresses stuff. And that like this is the most important part actually. Like uh, it go, it makes your executable like from 20K something into 4K. Uh, so yeah, and that, that there are other bits and pieces like shader minifier, for example, that like compresses your shader, like removes all the, your really uh, lengthy name uh, variables into like one character, stuff like this. Uh, so yeah, th there are like a few s uh, sample projects on the internet and I'm planning to release my framework in a few days or weeks, uh, which is like assembly and like it's <coughs> quite a bit better than this C stuff out there. So it sounds like a tech stack can be looking at other people's sample code and hack from there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, usually what you need uh, like s to start, you can look at Shader Toy, for example, like what people do there, like because it's usually really similar into like this uh, fragment shader stuff. And try to like just take that shader and put that into like 4K framework and like do something with music separately like for Clan and or like, you can also do music in shaders too. So we're going to what? Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. <coughs> adding to what Michael and Ivan said, another thing you can do, um, since you specifically mentioned Windows as a platform, four kilobytes on Windows are a little bit quirky in the sense that yes, your your intro is only four kilobytes in size, but you have access to the entire Windows file system. So it helps to familiarize yourself, um, familiarize yourself with what is available there, what kind of media files you can assume are always installed in your machine, mm. and you can pull those in. Obviously not as such, but you will distort them, or yeah, and then in the don't case of sound, um, pulse stretch them, and then that might give you a soundtrack for free. Yeah, and then don't release it revision, because in the rules it says that you don't have file system access. So. <laughs> uh, do they now? I'm yeah, yeah, it's, um, <laughs> because Windows nowadays comes with like a, a lot of things and it would be like almost, um, uh, yeah, almost unfair to like other categories like Amiga 4K to say, oh, look, you have all this Windows media folder with all these things in there. Mm. I'm actually so glad to hear that. That always, yeah. sad, that always felt wrong in my head. All right. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. I think the f next one was in the front row and it was over there and then it's over there, if that's okay with you. Uh, uh, hey there, um, what's the best way to connect with other demo seniors online? Are there like Facebook groups or websites, forums, or just emailing a demo scene maker that you like? Sounds like a Joe question to me. Mm. Mm -hmm. I can only speak from my platform. There's csdb.dk, which has um, all the demos that were ever released for the C64, as well as all the other software that was ever released, as well as forums. Um, there's also a messaging app, something like an IRC channel built into this page. So that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, so what you'll find is that generally there's a platform specific forum. So if you're very interested in Amiga, very interested, I think you've got Exotica. If you're in really interested in the, uh, in the 64, CSDB is the place to go. Pretty much every, uh, every Cena has a like a profile page, it's like the Facebook of C64 demo scene, right? Uh, and then you've got the more broad reaching, like Poe, it's P A U E T dot net. Net, yeah. Um, so Poe's got pretty much everything ever made on any platform and has, uh, uh, you see, in the old days, in the olden days, 
we used to put our addresses in the scroll text. <laughs> so we'd send letters to each other. It was great. But, um, uh, and so nowadays, you'll find uh, the occasional uh, info file will have contact details in it. People will put their email address in there. Uh, you'll find the demo seeners have their websites and then you can contact them from that. So there's, like, there's many ways of doing it. You can do it from the forum level or if you find a release that you just think is absolutely awesome, just get in contact with the people. Go to their website, and the, everyone's always super happy to talk about their releases, right? I mean, you, you heard what these guys were talking about today. That this, is the, this is the stuff that inspires the heck out of me, right? So, um, yeah, everyone else will be, generally speaking, just as super excited to share their stuff too. So, yeah, by any means necessary, right? And then the, obvious, the other obvious one is find a party um, of which, again, go to these scene websites and they will promote the parties. They tell you when the parties are happening, where they are, how much they cost, how to get there. Uh, and so again, it's an easy way to start connecting with people and preparing yourself for actually going meeting them face to face. Yeah, which is Otherwise, which is awesome. there, is, there is the Facebook thing. We've got Ozscene, A-U-S-S-C-Y-E-N-E, Ozscene. Yep. Um, yeah, of course. Sorry. Which is on yeah. Facebook, or there is a, we were talking about this before, if we've, <clears throat> we've sort of got a Discord kicking around, but we're gonna try to make something a little bit more Obvious. Um, if you're interested in the Australian party, certainly down south, how many people here are from Melbourne out of interest? Anyone? A few people? Yay. So we've got Syntax Demo Party down in Melbourne, which is just Syntax, S-Y-N-T-A-X. If you look for Syntax Demo Party, there's a website there and that'll link to the various Facebooks and things. At um, some point, we've probably got to put a link to whatever we choose. We were talking about this the last couple of days as a platform to communicate on. Because the platforms keep changing. Everybody knows this. Like, we used to all be forum-based and so now we'll probably yeah, go that next step. I'm gonna throw that question for the international audiences. So maybe I'm thinking, Paul, can you, how did you get connected to the demo scene for yourself? Ah, um, I gotta give credit to Rick Sayer for doing that, who's um, one of our uh, soup techs at Pixar. He's uh, been in the community for a while, and I blame you, Inigo, and you, Paul, <laughs> potentially, for also inspiring us. Uh, and one of the cool, so we did basically a work event, and it was kind of nice because we knew other people wouldn't, like, we could uh, be really bad, potentially, and no one would know, because it's just like, you know, among our friends and coworkers. And I think that sort of has given us confidence. But one of the cool things about that is um, people that have since left Pixar keep coming back to do the demo party. So it's kind of like a, just a group of friends now that sort of started. So if you are in a company that's got a lot, like, people that might be interested in it, maybe, you know, as opposed to, like, you know, an after work, you know, yoga thing, make it an after work demo scene thing. Yeah, host your own demo scene party at work, okay. Yeah. That's and how it you do it. It is all about the fun. I mean, you're seeing some cream of the crop stuff here, but we do a lot of stuff that is purely just for fun as well. Um, don't get caught up in thinking. There's a whole category called wild in the demo scene, which is take anything and do something cool with it. Um, and that we had someone doing like a magic show at the last one and then someone else doing like all this, oh, like an XY demo on an old oscilloscope sending blasts of noise to it, making all these random shapes. and they couldn't quite figure out how to get it working, and, and, but, but like it just come up with these cool experiments, and it was, so everyone's just cheering and you know, um, and having a good time. So it's it's a lot about that fun, especially in Australia as well. Like we've got a particularly fun. Uh, we don't take we have the, the odd serious thing, but a lot of it is just fun tech demo stuff that you know you could just sit around and do in your room. And after a point, you're like, well, you know, or sitting after work, work and saying, well, why am I doing this if I can't if I don't have a platform for it? So it's nice to package up some of those creative ideas sometimes and just go, <laughs> here it is. What do you guys think? So, yeah. Okay, uh, questions over there. By the way, you folks are great. I don't have to use any of my questions. This is awesome. Right, so I was thinking, um, you, you said earlier, uh, um, limitations inspire creativity. Is there, uh, looking at the current demo scene and, and the competitions, you have 64K, you have maybe sometimes 256 bytes. Is there a limitation you could come up with that you would like to see that doesn't exist yet? Is there, what, what, would you, what would you say if you had to come up with a new limitation? So uh, the, the compo that I would like to see, I, I don't know if I would ever take part in it, but would be um, you're not allowed to take like off the shelf hardware and you basically, I don't know, you solder a FPGA <laughs> to a logic board and you start from there. Um, yeah, but that, that, that's only like my, my dream fantasy. So uh, what, what do you guys think? Bring software rendering back. No graphics card. I'd like to see. You get yeah, some really cool yeah, stuff. Good, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
Okay, is there any other questions? Otherwise, I'm gonna throw a couple of questions off my, oh, there's two more, okay, in the front. Anything else? So thanks very much for showing the demos and the presentations and whatnot, it was pretty awesome. Now, I've sort of passively watched some demo scene stuff most of my programming life, which is like 20, 25 years now, since I was a child. I started on a similar 8-bit machine at BBC Micro. I always liked doing graphic stuff. Then I seen demo scene. I thought, oh, that's cool, but that's like way beyond me. So I kind of just enjoyed watching it occasionally, and I ended up getting more into doing game jams, which the limitation is often usually you have two days to make a game, and that's it. I'm wondering if any of you have uh, ever participated in similar things since it's the you know creativity inspired by limitation sort of aspect that anybody's was shared. Um, yeah, I mean. So sometimes, especially with Commodore stuff, you can you can write something in a in a day, like uh, the actually at the last syntax that I went to, which was not not this year but the, the previous year, I wrote a, a, a little demo called Plasma Toy. Um, we were staying at an Airbnb, and I was like, man, I finished this intro that I was going to submit, so I'm going to make a whole new entry. Like, why not? Let's do it. And so. Uh, me and Greg and, and uh, John, we basically all just came together and they're like, yeah, add this thing on the plasma, do this, add the, yeah, like the shadow looks, and we just, we just pulled it together. It's awesome fun. So I think that um, these parties are kind of like that forum where if you want to, like we don't have a, uh, I actually like the idea of saying actually, you know, start with a blank canvas, what can you do in two days? Right, which is kind of, actually that's kind of what Ivan does when, when you've got uh, shader coding compos, right? When you have a shader showdown, you start with a blank canvas and you have 20 minutes to make a awesome cool shader. Uh, and I think that's kind of, in a way, that's like the future of, of where things are going with the, the whole GPU thing is, yeah, like shader showdowns are, are so cool. Because uh, there's this showmanship aspect of it where it's, it's an excitement, people are cheering you on as you're in there writing the code, which is so not what normally happens when you're writing code. <laughs> <laughs> Put so. it into perspective, there's two people on stage having a code off and people commenting and then like hundreds of people cheering and looking at what's going on and going, oh, so, oh, and then some people will know more than others about how they, you know, what their tricks are using and it's, it's literally a code off and then that person goes to the next round and yeah, it's a good, yeah. they're fairly long competitions, five, six hours worth of like back-to-back -back sort of entries. You tree it up from, I think, eight people, is it? Yeah, there are like three, uh, there are uh, usually eight people, so three stages, like elimination, like only one goes to the next round, and like each round is 25 minutes. Uh, they were like interesting, like you, each round you have to start from scratch, and like it, usually each round like takes about uh, five to 10 minutes to just get some boilerplate done, so like black screen and nothing. Uh, yeah, uh, th there was another take uh, in Poland. They did this thing where you a a actually in next stage you could continue writing your previous shader, which is like it's a different but also interesting. But I, I digress. Mm. <laughs> that's awesome. That's cool. But yeah, so that, I think that's kind of nearly our equivalent of game jam. Like I love the concept of game jams. I love the concept of um, just that the hackathon idea, right? Where you, uh, sometimes there's this similar thing in the security field where they have two days where you've got to capture the flag. Um, and I like that kind of concept is just awesome. It's great fun because it's bringing people together as a team, that whole concept and feel of the demo scene, it's like in, in a super intense period of time. So yeah, I love it. It's a, it's a great thing. Okay, um, I feel obliged to say that I'm the poster track chair for the International Conference on Game Jams in Osaka next year. <laughs> so if you have any papers you would like to submit from Game Jams, uh, the submission deadline, I believe, is not like scheduled even yet. It's probably March or April. So anyway, uh, next question over there. It was just on the topic of constraints. Uh, do PC demos have memory uh, limitations as well? Uh, no, they have not anymore. And I do not know how I feel about it <laughs> yet. Because yeah, I can imagine. Are you talking about when, RAM when limitations or file size limitations? No, um, mem uh, RAM. Like your usage of RAM. Uh, oh, RAM. Yeah. No, RAM. You can how much ever is in in the competition machine that that is there. That's uh, use use all of it and then some. So yeah, right. Uh, usually, like 4K intros, like the, your executable 4 kilobytes, but it takes like a few gigabytes to unpack it. So. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Well, that's and that's kind of where I was going. It's it's interesting uh, as a. An interesting constraint would be, you know, how could you, because platforms like your Commodore 64 have a very yeah. fixed yeah. memory, yeah, and so you have to be yeah. clever about the way you 
Yeah, the 64 K demo on a C64 would would be like you can't only use all the RAM that's there. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, I have a few of my own. Okay, I'll start with one. So uh, I was talking to a few panelists earlier, and I think one of the questions that came in from Matthias was, you want to see where demo scene is going from other panelists, right? So maybe if I can grab uh, maybe Paul de Vivic. Uh, what do you think, where do you think demo scene is going in the next, say, three to five years? Well, hopefully it's going to continue at SIGGRAPH, and that we'll have this in the North American conference as well, and we'll have continued sessions. I thought it was really exciting that you actually brought the real hardware uh, to the to the show floor uh, this year, because I think seeing this, you know, the physical things in, in the flesh for some folks who have never seen these computers before uh, is going to make a big difference. Um, you know, there's also, I think, you know, the, you know, a bit of a spiritual connection to the maker space as well, and also trying to, you know, doing things like the closest things that I do, things are sort of demo scene a, a, a little bit, or like working with constraints is like just programming you know, very inexpensive, cheap versions of things that look like light stages using um, NeoPixels and Arduinos and things like that. So perhaps trying to bridge uh, what you can do, uh, you know, Commodore 64 is kind of like an Arduino too, right? That little mm -hmm. port on the back left actually could use, I, I, at one point I did a demo to turn on little LEDs. So maybe getting demo scene to do things that aren't just on the screen, but also actually do things, you know, with physical motors and lights as well could be interesting. Okay, I'm gonna throw that question to Chris or so Citrix, if you don't mind. <coughs> yeah, I mean that's an interesting one actually. I mean there is it's never been a better time to get involved with um or you know, you think about the, the cost of the little LED strips, addressable strips or motors or three D printers or any of that stuff. It's really affordable now and there's a lot of um yeah, re like hackspace and things that do uh, happily like lend out whole kits for things and um yeah, I mean, it's really hard to say where it's going. There's, there's two sort of things. It's quite expensive, and it's uh, there's a lot now where the graphics card manufacturers are already doing the demos before they ship the products. So it's not really up to us to showcase these new things you can do with graphics cards. It's sort of already been considered before it's been released now. Um, so it, it's kind of, that's why there's that little bit more resurgence, I think, of the old school thing, where it's a platform that's locked down and we, we're kind of like still exploring it. So I think there's, there's definitely the two sides. There's the new sort of side that people will still be pushing for fun, especially with the size limitation. Um, but also the old school stuff, I think, has still got a, a bit of a future as well. But I do agree, as far as new stuff, that, that crossover into hardware. It's called, we have this, as we said before, this wild category, and it is an anything goes category. I think VR stuff, I loved a few years ago, I don't know how many people jumped on that VR bandwagon with the DK1 and DK2 headsets and just seeing that excitement of people, just all those indies creating cool demos where you put the headset on and it's just a little experience. I really felt that um, that had that massive... So, so hopefully with the Quest and things like that we'll see more art projects and inspire more procedural things that can happen maybe with a crossover into dance mats and things like that but linking back into the headsets, who knows, you know, it could be fun. Awesome. Do we have any questions from the audience? I thought I saw someone in the back, but I didn't see anyone afterwards anyway, because the light's really bright. Okay, I have one more question, and we do have a uh, time for a few more questions as well. So I'm gonna throw this one to Michael uh, for start. How has DemoSync helped you in your career, and why? Um, okay, so a, a lot of the times in like the San Francisco Bay Area, you get asked the question uh, when you're pitching or something, so w what's your unfair advantage and people uh, you, who wear like suits and are like really, really businessy, they, they want to have a good answer for that. I most of the time don't have a good answer for it, but um, f for this circle, my, my, uh, my superhero power or my, uh, my unfair advantage would be I'm a demo scener. So, uh, because you work with, um, you have the teamwork aspect, you work uh, uh, like in a, in a close knit group and you have uh, deadlines and you work towards the deadline with like all your until your heart bleeds basically um, and that's that's two things that um, I think normal people or I don't want to yeah but regular coders or regular 10x engineers as they say um, uh, don't really get so th this is my unfair my unfair advantage or this is what the demo scene has done for me yeah yeah do I see do you want to do it Paul you're looking at me okay no oh. I was actually just, I hope more demo sceners apply actually to the CG studios in the industry because the technique is super applicable. And I wonder what's those crazy demos I see. Like, where are those people? Like, come over and work for the effects industry, you know? 
Help yeah. with USD. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you would think they were already applied. That's interesting. Okay. Um, do we have any more questions? Otherwise, I got one more. No? Okay. So I'll throw this question to, uh, to Joe, because you're from a 64 background, and maybe to Matthias as well. What's your favorite rendering cheat? <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay, my favorite rendering cheat. Uh, I, I, I can't answer that question without being super technical on a 64. <laughs> but I think, uh, yeah, just messing with bad lines. <laughs> on a 64, you mess with the bad line, good stuff happens. Um, so, yeah, basically... Uh, could you explain for the audience what a bad line is? Yeah. <laughs> Real quick. Actually, you know what, Matthias, you should explain what a bad line is. <laughs> I should explain what a bad line is. Okay, sure. <clears throat> um, every... So, on a C64, um, the video chip generates a signal that's meant for a PAL television, essentially. So you have a raster line that walks around in zigzag lines across your screen. Um, and while the graphic chip is doing that, it needs to read from memory. And sometimes it reads, needs to read so much memory that it has to stall the CPU for a little while. That happens every eight lines, and that's a bad line. Um, regarding the question, um, favorite rendering trick, I like the tricks where you render something, and what appears on the screen is not what the viewer actually sees. So for example, I showed something yesterday where you copy eight by eight blocks out of an image and just you know, put them next to each other. But it looks as if you're transforming the entire image even though you're just copying blocks of, of eight by eight. Um, and similar, if you Sometimes you can put multiple techniques on top of each other. So for example, you move an image around um, and that's at the same time you're cycling a texture through the image and if you do those two things that they cancel out, you suddenly get something quickly even though that's not actually what you're rendering. Mm -hmm. So I like the, the optical illusions mm -hmm. approaches to, to rendering. Alrighty, so if we, if we have one more burning question, this is the time, okay, we have uh, in the front. So with, uh, with demo scene, uh, you've got on one end, you've got the, uh, uh, the focus on the cinematic aspects, the sort of big long narratives, that sort, of, that sort of thing. And on the other side, you've got basically just showing off really cool effects and trying to push the hardware as far as it'll go and make the coolest looking thing. When, when you're actually working on a demo, where do you sort of draw the line between uh, making something that is sort of interesting to look at and uh, shows off a really cool effect and something that like presents a narrative and, and sort of is something that the people that are watching can actually like sort of really get into. Do you want to take that, Joe? Um, I, I'd like to maybe just preface it because I think there's vastly more qualified people here to answer that question. But from an, uh, observing it, what I find Really, this is the this is the kernel of the demo scene, especially with coders, letting them have time to play, right? And the more time they have to play, the more little random bits and pieces they have lying around. And then, the creative direction aspect is really about becoming familiar with all of the cool, fun things that coder has done at some point, or telling a story, building a story together, and all of a sudden, you know, the coder, goes, oh, yeah, actually, I've kind of got a thing. So you don't, you don't, in a sense, build a demo. You, it, really what you're doing is doing a lot of play and then bringing the bits and pieces that kind of sort of worked and sometimes you get these serendipitous explosions into the narrative. Yeah, so it's sometimes, and it's not always as black and white as that, but it's this idea of bringing the pieces of your play into the narrative and then building the narrative uh, to then adapt the pieces that you played. Um, yeah, if, if I can jump in there, so uh, I, I heard people saying about uh, the writing process, you should write what you know, and for, for Mercury to do the Fermi paradox was, um, actually we got like really, really pissed by um, uh, a demo from a, a Hungarian group called Conspiracy, and they had planets in there, and they were like much too close together, and it wouldn't work with like the gravity, 
and we are like all really, really big space nerds, and we have our own astrophysician in our group. <laughs> and there's um, there's a, a lot of times where we just like nerd out and like talk a whole evening about like this tiny aspect of like the Fermi paradox or a space elevator. And we have like all these elements in there. So we have the space elevator. We have like the civilization that gets destroyed. We have um, we have uh, um, the dynamics of the of the of the planets. Um, uh, the space station. We have a uh, 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 the um, uh, Titan. What is it called? Uh, the Messane Lakes on Titan that have like the uh, um, physically correct values for the Messane Lakes on Titan and like all these nerdy kind of things. This is like you write what you know, right? And so when when uh, and this this other demo that, that I was referencing that um, one and we got only second. That was when we say, okay, gloves come off. Now we're going to make the 64 space demo that's uh, there to end all the other ones and. Yeah, then it took us a year and we uh, and a lot of time and a lot of failed attempts, but um, then we did it, yeah. So, and yeah, th this uh, goes back to like write what you know. So, we would probably not have done a demo about um, shapes of milk bottles <laughs> because we don't literally don't know anything about it. Okay, I think this is about time to wrap up. So, could you uh, please give the big applause to the presenters, our AV people, Ada in the back, and Nick, and the student volunteers? Thank you very much.